Okay, so Stephanie will be presenting today her PhD work you know, on information theory on non-parametric learning in probabilistic prediction applications in earth science and geostatistics. So thank you, Stephanie, for presenting today and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Leila. So can you properly see the my screen and my laser here? Yes. Yes, good. So yeah, good morning, good evening for you. And this presentation, as Leila told you, it's about my PhD. I defended it on December last year. And it's basically the same presentation I, I've done in the defense, but I decided for that because I think it's a good consolidation of what we have done so far with information theory in earth science. And you will see that it's divided in three sections, each one of them addressing a published paper. And yeah, this is just to give you a big picture of everything we have done, Uwe and me. And yeah, we could split this presentation in the future if you have some interest in on a specific section here, or we could discuss it, it deeper in the end of this presentation. But yeah, that's it. And here just quickly commenting the outline of the presentation. I will introduce the motivation and goals of my thesis. And I will quickly cover a few fundamentals of information theory, which were the base of our three papers. Each one of them showed in as a main session in this presentation. And here we address problems ranging from time series analysis, spatial interpolation, and simulation. And finally, I will draw some conclusions and share what I see as challenge for future work. And primarily, I just invite you to reflect on the complexity of Earth systems and in our limitation on observing everything everywhere all the time, added to our lack of complete understanding of relevant systems and their interactions. So the, the complexity comes from this multitude of nonlinear and interrelated processes acting across a wide range of spatial and temporary scales. And the problems are underdetermined as we usually like exhaustive measurements. So modeling our systems is challenging and we normally mitigate the situation by transferring insights gained in other similar systems to inform the problem at hand. So however, transferring uh, knowledge means that different sorts of information are combined without explicitly keeping track on their particular uncertainties and the uncertainty, uncertainties for their hampered by deterministic models, which do not offer a direct way to account for uncertainty. And considering that uncertainty is part of our system problems, this thesis is motivated by the need of a more generalized framework to deal with complex systems and interactions of different sorts of information while moving away from strong parametric assumptions. And here information theory is used to explicitly calculate and compare information uh, and content of data and models. And we go non-parametric to avoid as much as possible conceptualizations and compression of data relations and to estimate uncertainty directly from data. So, here I have the fundamental quantity of information theory. We are quite familiar with it, the entropy. And I, uh, this is what the example I use in my defense, but yeah, basically we calculate the expected number of binary questions needed to reconstruct our data or its entropy using this equation from information theory. And the advantage of using entropy is that we have this intuitive definition of uncertainty and we are able to make comparisons in the single unit, in this case here, bit. And there are also other concepts I used along these three papers. And what's important here is, uh, let's say that our um, previous, uh, the, the uncertainty calculated with the previous equation is given by this Venn diagram here. And what so it's important is that this general idea that using another variable, let's say y, can help us to reduce the uncertainty of x by calculating the amount, amount of information both share or, uh, or the mutual information. And subtracting 
this motor information for, from the uncertainty we had from X, we obtain the conditional entropy. This means that when we conditional, when we condition our X, uh, if the, the, our distribution of X to the Y information, we are able to, instead of just having the marginal distribution of X, we are able to reduce our uncertainty to this uh, green distribution here. So we condition on X to the Y, and then we can update our knowledge about the X. And another concept used here is the Kubek Library Divisions, which help us to compare how different two distributions are. It takes into, into consideration both their position in the axis and their spread. And the cross entropy, we will see in, in the next section of, in the first section in the, of this presentation, is basically the sum of the uncertainty of our reference distribution, let's say X, and the divisions between what we are comparing. So the first application of this framework of data-driven modeling and information theory, theory was published in 2019. And here we propose to automatically identify rainfall runoff events in a discharge time, discharge time series. And rainfall runoff events here refers to these periods of rising, peak, and discharge, uh, and recession in a river discharge caused by rainfall. The problem of event identification was selected because we want to relax assumptions and bring the uncertainty perspective to the results instead of going deterministic. So the catchment we used here is in Austria, from where we have nine years of discharge here in blue and precipitation in black, both in our, res our resolution. So the gray bands here are the events that we have manually identified. The idea is to use them for learning, similar to a supervised learning method from machine learning. So for these gray bands here, we have 12% uh, of the time steps being classified as event and 88% as non-event. And when we calculate the uncertainty of this non-event event distribution, Using the entropy equation we have seen, this results in 0.5 bits of uncertainty. And this value was used as reference to check which predictor can reduce the uncertainty the most. For the predictors beyond the precipitation and discharge, we have also created or tried to extract key features of the discharge by calculating, for example, the slope of the discharge curve or the logarithm of the discharge. We have also tried to vary the time step we are looking at, for example. With the predictors and the uncertainty reference in hand, the method is built, uh, is the method is basically to build models by basically conditioning our event non-event distribution to the predictors and check out how much, how much uncertainty they can reduce. For example, here in this one predictor model, the probability of event given that we know discharge can reduce our uncertainty, reference uncertainty from 0 0.5 to 0 0.26. Uh, this means about 50% 50, 50 of our original uncertainty. And then we build models with one, two, three, and four predictors. And we select the best ones in each stage for robustness analysis. But why? So we can see here the more predictors we have, the smaller the uncertainty, reaching here 22% of our reference. And, but this is good, but this also means that we increase the chance of overfitting our data set to the model because with more predictors, we have also more variables in the model, but the same amount of data. And then for the model evaluation, we used Kubeck library divisions. We calculate the divisions between the distribution built with a full data set and a distribution built with a sample of it. So we tested different sample size and plot them against the cross entropy. Uh, and the idea here, here is to check how large the data set should be to properly represent 
the full data set distribution. And considering the stabilization of this learning phase here, represented by this quasi horizontal line, we arbitrarily set a maximum of 5% of increase on the divergence in relation to the cross entropy to define the amount of data needed to avoid overfitting. So in general, the more predictors we have here, the smaller the uncertainty and the larger is the data set needed to have a stable model, a robust model. For example, yeah. model 20, sorry, yes? No, Stephanie, sorry to interrupt. Could you say something about what is the structure of this model? Uh, I think I'm lost a little bit, so. Okay, it's basically we are, uh, we have PMFs, maybe a, you could see as a 3D PMF, where you have your the variable, your target variable as in one X and the predictors in the other X. And we basically make a bin counting of the frequency. We count the frequency of each one of the values we have in each bin we define. I see, okay. Is it clear? Yeah, no, so you're just using essentially conditional PDF to- uh, Exactly. Predict. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I called model, yeah. Yeah, so it's essentially the mean of the conditional PDF. That's your best predictor. Is that fair to say? Um, I mean, you, you have so to we predict. are analyzing here the frequency of this PMF. Not okay. we are not using the mean. Then we are analyzing the frequency, and we are adding new predictors to define how this uh, frequency changes with when we add new predictors okay. to this structure. Yeah. And here, for example, model 29, where we have four predictors. So we have a 5D PMF here. Uh, one is the target and the other five, four are our predictors. This model could reduce our uncertainty by 70, almost 78%. So, and then uh, it needs uh, 70,000 uh, data points to be considered robust in our arbitrary arbitrary uh, cutoff here, and we select it for uh, the model application. And then we applied this model 29 directly on our data set, and as output, we have obtained the probability of each time step as being part of an event, and it's represented here in red. And here we can see this this very high probabilities in the, of events where we expect to have events, given that we have the gray bands here. And with too high but smaller probability, other potential events. So to allow us the, uh, the comparison of this model with a physically based model, we have uh, simplified our probabilistic predictions here in red to a binary output, event, non-event. And here, this plot shows you the events identified by our model in Magenta and the events identified by the, the physically based model in Cyan. And we train the model in one data set and check the performance in the test set. I will not go into details on the performance definition here, but arrows facing up means the larger the better, arrows facing down the smaller the better. So in summary, both methods uh, showed competing accuracy, but for different reasons. Reasons, Interestingly, our ITM method presented 97% of true event identification against 84 for CPM at the cost of a higher uh, false positive rate in relation to the physically based model. So to wrap up the lessons learned throughout this paper with information theory, we were able to quantify the uncertainty of data sets and use it to select the most informative model to and to verify its robustness in terms of data set size. So going data driven here allows us more uh, models free of functional assumptions, which handle any, which could handle any kind of data relations. And it also allows us to obtain probabilistic predictions directly based on data instead of going deterministic, although the conversion from probabilistic to deterministic was also possible. 
And since we were able to extract the most informative predictor here, the method can help us to understand the drivers of the system or also be used for feature selection in the machine learning context. So in the next two sessions, instead of analyzing time series, as we have, uh, I have done here, we will work with spatial data. And this is the Ms. second Stephanie, paper. Yes. May I ask you a question? Sure. OK. So if I wanted to use your method, what kind of conditions should my stream gauges um, have in order to obtain this kind of results? It should uh -huh. have... Yeah. So well, I would say it depends on, the, on your catchment. But for example, here, the CPM, for the CPM, the physically based model, there is this limitation that you must have this hourly data set for applying it. In our case, as we are free to use or to build our PMFs the way we want, I would say there's no limitations in the sense. So there is no resolution needed in terms of the method, but maybe your catchment will be limited. It depends on how fast or how slow you, you can identify it or, or this rainfall can reach your, the river where we are reading the, 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 the discharge. So the condition would be in, the limitation would be in the other side, I would say. But in terms of resolution of the data set or the kind of data set or, or, or the data set you, you need to use, you could select the ones you have available and make use or make the best use of it, I would say something. That's what I would say for limitations in this sense here. Does this answer your question? Yeah, sure. I, I was so considering probably just adding a little bit more on that. Uh, probably the location of the stream gauges and the, uh, might, might have some of uh, will add some complexity to the to the evaluation, right? Like if you have a catchment that only has one uh, rain gauge, but then um, it captures the behavior of the catchment upstream, and you only have an stream gauge that it's at the outlet of the catchment, uh, then I don't know how well it will represent the response of the of what it's going on upstream. I, I mean, I, I guess you might need to consider some um, well description of the catchment in order to use a given stream gauge in a, in a given rain gauge, right? So it's mm -hmm. something that matches both the behavior, right? Yeah. Yeah, for it's not basically what we usually discuss is not that this method is basic, they only data driven, but it needs some knowledge about what you're trying to model, right? So in this sense, I would say if you have maybe a string gauge that doesn't give you exactly what you want, probably you need to add new predictors that can help you to extract this information or to that you could combine these other predictors to extract what we are looking for. And also here we are working with supervised learning. So we need to have these identified events given by an expert. So depending on the way you identified your, your events, you could also use this information to establish your predictors or the ones you want to test. I see. Thank you, Stefan. Okay. And then, yeah, that, that's the second paper then. So the first part was about time series, and now we are talking about spatial data. And for brevity here, I will focus this second session, I will focus on the method itself and its properties. And I will check, a, uh, we will check a real application in a real data set in the third and last session of the presentation. And 
Yeah, so her is a method to get through missing spatial values. And it combines information theory and probability aggregation methods in a geostatistical framework. And we propose it to bring more generality to spatial interpolation, therefore bypassing variable fitting and functional assumptions for uncertainty estimation. So additionally, we were looking for a proper framework for uncertainty estimation that predicts larger errors in locations surrounded by very different data, instead of just considering the distance or the distance of the observations. And this is a known condition of the ordinary reading, another geostatistical method called homocedasticity. And going step by step in the method, let's say here we want to fill the gaps of this uh, of Z in this field here where we have some observations in black. And then the first step is we calculate the difference between the Z values and we plot it against, against the Euclidean distance or the Euclidean separation distance of these pairs. And then we plot it here. For each defined leg here, first, second, third, we define these legs, we extract the distribution of the delta Z. And here they are. So we condition the delta Z to the leg, and then we obtain the delta Z distribution. And for each distribution here, or probability mass function, we calculate the entropy and plot it against the Euclidean distance to obtain what we call infogram. And note here that the uncertainty is decreasing the closer the points are, indicating that near observations are more informative or less uncertain than distant observations. So in addition, we uh, this horizontal line here represents the full data set entropy. When we, we don't condition the, the data set to the leg here, and it's used to define the range of the data set. And then limiting our analysis to this range distance is interesting because as we can see here, the neighbors that are beyond this distance start to becoming to become uninformative. They present higher uncertainty in relation to the full data set. So in a simple case here on the right side, uh, we let's say we have observations A, B, and C, and we want to predict X. When we associate this delta Z distributions to our observations based on their distance to the target, and we shift it to the, the observation value, we obtain the probability of X given A, X given B, and X given C. But um, now the question is, how can we obtain the probability of X given that we know A, B, and C at the same time? And then for solving it, we borrowed aggregation methods from the con context of forecasting, which states that the probability of X given A, B, and C is a function of the probability of X given A, X given B, and so on. And there are many manners to aggregate PMFs, for example, additive and multiplicative ones, and I will illustrate them with an example. In practice, if we have two distributions, let's say P1 and P2 here, we could simply average them and we would obtain the OR combination of both. Now, uh, and yes, and now we, we could also multiply them or have taken their intersection to obtain the end combination of both. In the paper, we have also proposed a combination of these two distributions, pure OR, pure end, as a way of balancing these both behaviors. So additionally, we can apply weights to the distributions here. For example, if you wish to have a stronger influence of observations that are closer to our targets, for example, A here, it's closer, it should get higher uh, influence in the model. And for that, we use Kubek Lightweight Divergence and leave one out cross validation. And we propose to select the set of weights that minimize the divergence between the true left out observation and the predicted distribution. So, oops, here for a more intuitive uh, interpretation of the meaning of these uh, aggregation methods. For example, if we have 
an observation A and B in a continuous field, and we want to estimate the target X between them. We could expect that the value of X would be somewhere between A and B, and this can be achieved by the N combination or by multiplying probabilities. And if now we have two points A and B belonging to different categories, let's say soil types, for example, the target X will be then will then belong either to category of A or B, and this can be achieved by the mixture distribution given by the OR pooling. So we tested her using synthetic Gaussian fields in this paper. For brevity, I'm not going into details in analyzing the application and results, but we tested different, the different uncertainty properties for the aggregation methods and OR and, and OR for different um, field properties here, as you can see, different ranges and with noise and without noise. And we compare the results to other interpolation methods. The next uh, session, I will show the application of this method to a real data set then. But in summary here, we were able to use information theory to extract uh, spatial information and to minimize uncertainty. By construction, her predicts conditional distributions, which depends on both spatial configuration of the data and its values. And being that driven brought more generality to spatial interpolation by relaxing normality assumptions and by allowing to define the degrees of freedom of our model according to the number of distance class we define. So additionally, the choice of the aggregation method allows us some flexibility in combining distributions in different ways. And considering all of this, the next paper applied her to a real data set. And here we use it to assess local and spatial uncertainty. And the goal of the study is then further adapt her to handle categorical data and to test it in a real problem. And besides that, to avoid the smoothing effect of the interpolation, we have extended her to simulate fields that replicate the spatial variability of the data set. So we analyze her with a real case of soil contamination by lead in this Jura region in Switzerland. We use here the logarithm transformation of the lead for comparison purposes. So our data set is composed by 259 observations in the calibration set and 100 observations in the validation set. This is squares here. And we use the validation set for performance calculation. And based on local regulations, um, soil, lead, soil with lead concentrations above this critical threshold here of 1.699 are considered contamination, contaminated and they are indicated by this red outline here. And 42% of our locations are above this critical threshold and then considered contaminated. So for the application, I will focus on comparing indicator Kriging and HER. Uh, indicator Kriging is another geostatistical method which has some properties similar to HER, and that's why I decided to compare both. So for the estimate map, of her on the left and the indicator rigging on the right, they are quite similar, where we have these regions of high light concentrations here in yellow and low light concentrations in, in the east and north here of both maps. And here we can see that her presents larger areas of extremely low or extremely high light concentrations in relation to indicator gradient. For the local uncertainty, this entropy map here, meaning uh, the, the color here scheme means that uh, more spread out distributions are represented in yellow and narrow ones in pink. And in both cases here, we can nicely check the impact of the heterogeneous regions in the uncertainty when we contrast it with the ordinary Kriging map, which basically uh, simply represents lower uncertainty in regions than of observation. And this doesn't happen here in both cases. 
um, with the predicted distribution in hand, we obtain the probability to exceed the critical threshold but, uh, of floods by accumulating the probability above the threshold. So both methods here showed high probability contamination in black in regions where we saw high lead concentrations and low prob probability of contamination in regions where we saw low lead concentration. And again, her presents larger areas in black and light gray in relation to indicator green. And finally, if we set a cutoff here in this probability, we can binarize our map into a contaminated and safe soil map. And yeah, this is, we, we call it classification map here. And when we zoom in on specific points from the, the validation and from the grid, we can abstract the details here and we can notice that the distributions from both indicator creating in red and her in gray present similar shapes for the predicted distributions of target A, for example, C, E, and D. And her predicts more uncertain distributions up with a broader spread than indicator creating for targets F, for example, and B. One located in this region of very sparse of data set, of data, sparse of data, and this other in this very heterogeneous region. So uh, we can also see that although both methods use the same amount of data, indicator creating presents or predicts distributions with many empty bins in relation to her. And in terms of performance here, similar errors and Nash Sutcliffe efficiency were obtained for indicator creating in her while her has shown slightly better results for the probabilistic predictions. And here we have the conf uh, a confidence interval for her in this cross session. And again, circles are points from the calibration set and squares from the validation set. Therefore, the squares were not used in the modeling. Uh, we can see that some of the calibration points exactly match the cross section where the uncertainty goes to zero. So in general, this information here is interesting, for example, for sampling strategy, this broader bands reaching very high uh, light concentrations here, give us the hint that we should further sample to reduce our uncertainty. In this case here on the right, we could sample between the two circles and confirm that our model is reasonable. Our prediction is reasonable. On the other hand, in contrast, in this case here, when we sample between these two observations, we can see that our uncertainty band should be even broader than it is, but now we can update our model and improve the results, improve the predict our predictions. So the last part of the paper presents the sequential simulation adaptation of her, or these are two arbitrary stochastic images produced with it. To obtain them for each location, we draw a single value from the predicted distributions, and we add to the data set as an observation to condition the next locations. So when comparing both cases here, we, uh, there is no much change in regions where we had low uncertainty, where we, we saw lower uncertainty previously, and we have uh, uh, greater change in more uncertain regions as the ones that were here. So the idea here is to obtain multiple fields to, replic to replicate the spatial variability of the observed data set. And to check that in red, we have, a plot, we have plotted the calibration set infogram here, which is what we want to reproduce. And the, in gray, we have the 100 generated simulations, which follows the calibration infogram with some fluctuation. So just for comparison here in blue is the infogram of the estimated map, this one here. And here we can nicely check the smoothing effect we were talking about previously. 
uh, just by looking at the maps here or by checking the reduced uh, variability or uncertainty of the data set in relation to the calibration set. And besides the generalization properties we have seen, now we adapted her to handle categorical data, this contamination uh, maps there, classification maps, and to obtain probability maps. And it's it was additionally extended to simulate fields to reproduce the spatial variability of the data set here with the simulation. So in relation to indicator creating, her has shown to be a unique tool for estimating non-parametric distributions, avoiding strong loss of information caused by data binization, which is a process that needs to be done for her for indicator creating. As we have seen, by using the same amount of data, her could nicely fill the beans of the predicted distributions without the need of extra assumptions or extra data which would be required by indicator creating here. So in conclusion, the thesis proposed and explored non-parametric modeling, firmly rooted in probability and information theory. And this integration provided on the one hand, a tool for certainty quantification and interpretation. And on the other hand, entails the, entails the generality needed to handle any kind of data relations and to estimate uncertainty directly uh, or in a straightforward manner. Of course, some challenges were faced throughout the applications, beginning with the binning choice, which directly affects the, uh, the, the, the quantification of the entropy. And it goes the other it, it goes by the amount of data needed to feed a robust model, which also affects the computational demands in relation to using an analytical function. So other limitations we have discussed in the thesis, and I highlighted here to be tackled in future work, is non-stationary modeling to address problems of change. Uh, merging both physically based and data driven models to be able to extract patterns of the data and be constrained by physical properties at the same time. The use of secondary data to improve uh, predictions of sparse data sets and to work with both spatial and temporal domains at the same time. So, yeah, the idea was to look in a fresh of at typical earth science problems. And what we have shown is that we were able to give some flexibility for modeling in terms of purpose, degrees of freedom, and data viability. Yeah, that's, that ends my presentation. And again, that was just a big picture of, of what we have done. We could discuss some sections in more details in a future meeting or today, if you want, yeah. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. That was a great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if anyone has a question. Then? Hi, uh, thanks, Stephanie. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. That was that was excellent. Um, I was really inspired by um, the HER method. I read it, of, of, I don't know, maybe last year. Um, and I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little more about, um, I guess, the, the, uh, the PMF aggregation methods. Did you, mm -hmm. uh, in, in this latest one, when you applied the method to to real data, did you, um, yeah, can you maybe, uh, I don't know, like- So the aggregation method part, I can, Yeah. I have it here, yeah. Uh, sorry, I guess I'm just uh, like, how did you apply it on on this uh, this real data set? Or did you, did you like, do you have any, um, yeah, I guess any findings about uh, benefits, you know, relative differences between them. Uh, uh -huh. 
Yeah, cool. Any interpretations of it? Yeah, nice question. So when we were uh, creating her, this was the point that everything changed because we were able to see that we could have the, this uh, conditional PMFs here, given that we have one information, but then the question was to obtain with the join probability, with the join, the conditional probability of this join observations here. And then we found this probability aggregation methods from forecasting. And then that nicely uh, helped us to solve our problem. And then the second question was how to select the aggregation method because you have many, many ways to do it. <laughs> and which one is the proper one for our case. And then we have tried to inter interpret this whole aggregation methods here in different ways. And this is where, when we come to a interpretation, the first interpretation was this one here. So there, there is this paper from Allard here from 2012, and he nicely explains and applies mathematical properties of the aggregation methods to earth science. And in summary, in this paper, he defends that we should mainly focus on multipli multiplication methods, the end combination, because if you check here, they will result in a more in a sharper distribution and it would avoid to have multi uh, multimodal results which could be the case of the OR combination here. And then, but then we thought, okay, let's say we have just two cases here. One is a categorical data and one is a continuous data. That would make properly sense if we have a very continuous data, because then we can expect that if we multiply our knowledge or distributions of both data points, we would, they mean, as we can see here. So the mean of both, if we take the mean of both, sorry, <laughs> if we take the means of both uh, uh, distributions here, with the end combination, we could obtain the mean of the means of this. And this is more or less what we expect if we have this behavior. But now if you have a categorical data, let, let's say we have a, a very deep slope, in a field and now how, how can we know what you have between them you know that if you are closer to a here the chances are that your x it's more like a if you are closer to b it's it should be more like b but if you are in between them how how should you d decide about that you it's you cannot simply average both because then this behavior you would not catch this behavior and then we decided to also include the OR combination here because then we can say, okay, now our points in between A and B can be either one or the other. And this is how the OR, or how we see that the OR combination works. So, and that's why we proposed a third uh, aggregation method here to make things worse. <laughs> now we have a third one. And then this one here combines both the pure end combination and pure or. And the idea here is that you could balance this both behaviors because you, you it's difficult to have a field that's perfectly continuous or perfectly uh, categorical would be a case, but you could have a mixture of both behaviors in this field and this could capture this. Let's Since we have weights here, as you can see in this exponent, you could have in the end a perfect end combination, uh, a pure end combination or a pure or. And this is what we thought that would be, let's let the, the data decide which, what's the balance between both behavior. And if it's a poor end, it will give a pure end exponent here. And that was more or less what we thought. So basically we are just applying the end, com end or combination in the second paper. So this whole idea, this whole interpretation was published in the second paper. 
And then when we decided that we have this balance in this and or combination here, we applied it in the third paper. That I hope that's clear enough. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's really good. Yeah. Well, you, I you, think... you got your hand up. Yep. So um, it was very interesting to to listen to your talk again, Stephanie. And I started to think around exactly the point that now Dan also pointed us at uh, about this probability aggregation. And I'm wondering what Alison's thoughts are on that. If we do a multiplicative combination, so the, the pure end, it basically means independent but both true sets of statements about what we're interested in. That's um, what we do when we multiplicatively combine two PMFs. So that would be the case of independence in, in Allison's and Travain's thinking. And when we instead do an OR combination, it means that they are not, not both predictors that we have um, provide independent bits of the truth, but they somehow provide an overlap, but also things that only one has and the other that we shouldn't exclude. Um, so this, I, I'm not sure whether that's true, but that's somehow um, uh, equivalent to having um, redundant pieces of information, but not fully. So I'm wondering, Alison, if these probability aggregations lend themselves to be analyzed in terms of you know, synergy, redundancy, and independence, and whether we could get from that kind of analysis also hints under which circumstances one or the other combination is preferable if we, for some reason, cannot do this data-based optimization as uh, Stephanie has now done in her work, just letting the data speak. Yeah, I'm not sure if I have a good, um, I, I was kind of thinking about that in terms of the, like the, the operator, like the multiplication versus the, the addition relationships. But then, but then when you said, well, or is if you have a um, discrete case and then, and is if you have a continuous thing, then that kind of got me going in a, in a different, in a different direction um, where what or gets you is it's either one thing or the other. So it's, it's, it is like a binary where an and gets you like a non-binary answer where that, that is kind of like you're, you're adding or multiplying um, where, or is really specifically like pick, pick one. Um, so I, so I bet I don't have a good grip on, on the, the methods particularly. Um, but, but I was thinking with, with these that it's, like I was kind of drawing like a, a map here where you have like a data point that you want to know information about and it's surrounded by say five, five data points that are kind of within range. And could you possibly use the relationships between those five data points in addition to the individual reduced uncertainties that you get from each data point individually in some way to make an even better prediction of that central data point which maybe that's what you're trying you're trying to do that with like the the and and or um but i was kind of wondering about that too yeah i i think this um here we are talking about a two points geostatistics that's a good point so we are always extracting information of the pair of points and making the whole assumption about these pairs. So we are always analyzing pairs. And there is this multiple point of statistics that would be somewhere between what you are talking about and what I'm talking about here. And then there you, you can have uh, the behavior of all points talking at the same time, not just two points. And the, the the method works totally different from this one because you need to have an image to be able to extract this pattern, an image that you will, you, you will use as a reference 
for uh, 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 extracting this spatial pattern for from all the points at the same time. Because here we don't have all the points, we have just a few points from the, the data. And yeah, but that's a good question. I think per partially we obtain this information when we do this and or aggregation, because then we, if the points, the neighbors of the point I, I'm analyzing are too different, then the or will take a higher uh, weight. But if they are more or less the same, then we could go for the end combination. It's yeah, somewhere between both methods. So, Stephanie, I'm I'm not at all comfortable with your interpretation. Um, I mean, Uwe brought up the main point, which is you're talking about a probabilistic combination of information, and mm -hmm. means both both sources of information are valid or means one is valid or the other is valid. Um, a mathematical combination of and and or can be done, but you have to be very careful what it actually means, okay? Just because you can do it mathematically doesn't mean that you have a good interpretation of what that actually means. Sometimes you can do all kinds of things mathematically which don't make sense, right? So, um, when you're using two sources of information, um, the mixture of and and or uh, implies that you're not sure whether it should be and or or, and the, the power that you put implies how much you're not sure of one or the other, right? If you put if you put a power of 0.5, it implies you're completely unsure about whether it should be and or or and et cetera, right? Um, the place where the and or makes more sense to me is when you're, com when you're combining multiple locations together because um, you're, you're, making, you're making a very strong assumption in the creaging process, which is this iso isotropy of the fields, right? That the infogram um, is the same in all directions, basically. Mm -hmm. And when you have a um, when you have a fault or a change in uh, geological media, it's not going to be, you know, it's either going to be a straight line or it's going to be some kind of curved property which runs through the medium which might separate um, the measurements on one side from the measurements on the other side, okay? Mm -hmm. um, in that case, I could imagine that you could say these five are uh, consistent or these five are consistent or these five are consistent or these five are consistent. You know, that, that's where the or makes sense to me. But saying that this is, uh, this or this is the valid, you know, your interpretation about distance makes sense, but um, but the, but when you when you combine it mathematically and say I'm just going to use a weighted combination for two, that reflects your uncertainty. It doesn't necessarily reflect a property of the medium. That's what I'm trying to say. Right? Okay. The distinction between the uncertainty that you have in your head, and then making the leap from that to say that uh, there is a certain actual thing going on in reality, right? And mm -hmm. that's, that's what's bothering me a little bit about the interpretation. Yeah, so um, I don't see this weight here, the exponent of n or as a measure of my uncertainty. What I see is for a field, it's very weak difficult to be a pure continuous field or let's say you have a lot of uh, not necessarily discrete but if you, if you have a lot of heterogeneity on your field you should be able to capture that and I believe this and or combination capture this continuous and very abrupt change in the field by when we combine both. So for example, if we have three very, very different distributions here, if we do 
if we just go for the N combination, we would be very, let's say, let me think of, let, let's say just two points then, because it's easier for me. But let's say you have two points that are different, and then the mean of this distribution, the, the, the intersection of them will be the mean of the Bose distribution, which is what we are having here. And the uncertainty would not be so large as if we would have used the or combination, right? And even though we are talking about, so what, sorry, first things first, one, one assumption of this method is that you have this, uh, you, you should consider this field with no trend so that you could be able to use it. So then you wouldn't have this case of a line that separates one, one field to the other, and then you could combine with the, them with the OR combination. And I also, this, I also see this feasible. If you have uh, points that ca can help you to, to extract another information, you could, could combine them with OR. But the interpretation here in one field is, is the idea to capture this heterogeneity on the field by the OR, and, and, and then mathematically it's sensible. And if the, the data says it to you, then if you, are, you have a poor, pure continuous then, data, then, then this exponent here would go to zero. Let's, let's be very then, careful. Let's be very careful. The data is not saying it to you. You are saying it to the data by your choice of model. Yes, yes. Okay. So you cannot say that the data is telling you that. The data will tell you whatever you want to hear by the choice of model that you put in there. Okay, this is the same question as to whether the information is coming from the data or it's coming from the model that I raised in an earlier discussion. So um, just because it works mathematically doesn't mean your interpretation is correct. You have to come up with an interpretation and then fit them. I mean, you have to, you have to come up with a description and fit the mathematics to that description not your interpretation to the mathematics. <laughs> That's what makes me a little bit uncomfortable about this, because as I said, or is a statement of confidence, okay? It's, you know, it's not a statement of degree. Probabilistically, when you, when you add distributions, you're saying this, this piece of information or this piece of information is correct. And if you, if you do and or mixture, you're, you're, the only interpretation that I've been able to come up with, but I'm, I'm open to being convinced, is that you're not sure which one, which one is true. It's the and or the or. It's not some combination of the two. Mathematically, you're interpreting it as a combination, but, but, but in terms of probability and statistics, it's not a combination. We as a comment. Yeah, a short comment. I think some of the ambiguity in this comes from the smallness of the data sets that we have. You know, we typically have just a few observations. And of course, we could easily do perfect predictions, but with overfitting, if we um, not only take the distances into account and, and bin that in a few distance classes, but if we would keep several points or relative positions, then you could easily predict from just three observations perfectly one you left out. Um, and because we have such limited data sets and want to avoid that, we do this pooling by saying it's just the distance that matters and not position on the, on the map. And then of course, in these pooled data sets, some statements are that they, um, that they support each other so you're allowed to combine them with an end, uh, sorry, with an, yeah, with an end, because for a particular unknown position, two parts of your PMFs would support each other to identify unambiguously the unknown point, but two others that are in the same distance class, but have been taken somewhere else, they actually contradict each other, or they have nothing to do with each other. And the best you can do is then to not exclude them. And that means you have to use them in an uh, end combination. So 
this and or fuzziness comes from the way we are pooling the data. You mean an or one, Yeah, but one um, issue that often mitigates this is that um, closeness very often wins. And um, Stephanie, I think it's correct that saying the weight you get for the closest distance classes was often very close to one. So mm -hmm. the far away distance classes were often not really important and the closest points got all the weight. So but this is, but this is consistent with Stephanie's comment about the fact that there's no trend. Okay. So the, the, moment, the moment you say that a particular measurement is not informative about another location, you're essentially telling me that there is some violation of your, your uh, 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 assumption that there is no trend. That's why I, I don't have a problem with the mathematical operation. I have a problem with the interpretation. Mathematically, you might get good results. I just, I'm just cautious about the interpretation, that's why. Because if you have a fault line, you're essentially saying, you know, what, what Stephanie just said correctly a, a minute ago, which is, is you, you're speak. saying that now you, you cannot assume that the field is does not have a trend in it. That's my, that's why my comment of you know you could have a, a bunch of uh, observations and you could have one in the middle. And that middle one might not have any relationship to the others, but it would be because it's somehow discontinuously separated from the others, right? But then let's just go to this. Maybe I can understand better your point of view. Let's just go to this uh, example here on the right, okay. right? So we have this field here. So it's it, it has a trend clearly, but it was just to make the point of the OR combination. But let's say we want to, oh, let's, let me think about it. That is exactly the point is you do have- a Yeah, let's say, but, but then you. the trend depends on your scale, right? So if you have a stone, for example, you could go further and zoom in in the stone and you will see this heterogeneity. If you go out, you have the stone, it's just a solid thing and then it's homogeneous again. And you could do this, depending on your scale, you could adjust your view from <laughs> what you have in hand. So this case here, it's clearly, you have a trend for sure, but let's say you have this same behavior in a whole field. You always have a lot of uh, deep slopes on your field and you take your field as a whole, N not just this part here, but you replicate this behavior many times. So you could extract the data and it's, there's no trend there. You have this, it's very homogeneous on, on the whole field. Can I, and then can, you I, have, can I just yes. clarify what you mean? So in other words, you have, uh, you have a mixed media where you have little regions of white and little regions of blue and they're completely randomly dotted around. So exactly. that the overall, the, so in other words, you have a mixed medium where you have two, two prop, you, you, let's say you've got a binary property and you have by random chance, you sample in the, the green and then by random chance you sample in the white and that could mm -hmm. be just uniformly distributed. That, that's what you mean, I think, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And then let's say now we want to predict around A and around B and between A and B, right? So around A, we would expect to have this continuous property here okay. because it's the smooth and around B the same, but between both, no, you have a very different behavior of both. Here we are talking about categories, but it could be elevation, a very different difference. You have a very high slope here and then they behave differently. And then that would be the way of balancing both behavior I was talking about, so. So um, is there a way for me to draw on this? No. Uh, there's no way to draw here, right? There's no... Uh, not sure. Okay. I um, can. <laughs> all right. So, I guess you'd have to unshare your screen and then... Ah, no, no, okay. That's, that, that, that's okay, leave this up. 
uh, let's take the let's take the one on the left, and let's assume that we have uh, a bunch of circles here, uh, uh, you know, little uh, circles of radii about one tenth of the of of the width of this field. So it's like a bunch of circles all randomly scattered. Like in this okay. Movie. Yep. Yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so your X happens to fall in one circle. Uh, sorry, your your A happens to fall in one circle and your B happens to fall in another circle. Mm -hmm. And some of these are green and some of these are white, and they're randomly uniformly distributed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the power on your and or would reflect to me the probability of sampling from a red or a green one. Your point 0.2 or the point 0.8 that you're putting over there, right? It would reflect the binary probability of sampling from one or the other. Mm -hmm. that, that, that would be my interpretation. Uh, yeah based on the structure that but, you're setting up over here. Because you're, not, you're now not talking about a homogeneous medium. You're not talking about a medium with a trend. You're talking about a heterogeneous medium um, where uh, your sample can either fall, fall in one of two different uh, possible properties. That, I mean, that's, that's the model you set up just now, right? Yeah, so in this case, if I understood correctly, we would have uh, these weights reflecting how our data set was sampled. No, and then it's reflecting the probability distribution of the white and green regions. Mm -hmm. And conditional on A being white, right? You know, you're now, you're, you're, your weights are now going to reflect the, pro the, the probability of your B being in a white or a green. Uh, it, yes. Because it's, because it's binary, right? I mean, you're saying it's and or. or. Yeah. And means it's in one region. The weights reflect the weight. When, when you combine the two, you're basically saying, uh, the, the weight the weight combination uh, the sum of the weights has to be up to one right you've got 0.2 and 0.8 in your example uh -huh. and uh, in in terms of in terms of interpreting uh, uh, uncertainty what that means is that I have a 0.2 uh, degree of confidence that uh, the information comes from one class and a 0.8 probability that it comes from another class. Yeah, but this in that sense it would make sense to me. Yeah. And then you should somehow have a good sampling from your field to be able to extract yes. the correct balance between both or so, the correct exponent of both. So if you're if you're fitting those as parameters, then the outcome of the parameter fitting could potentially is a hypothesis about the distribution, the random distribution of properties in the medium. Mm -hmm. And I mean it's a hypothesis. You would then have to go and test that, check that it makes sense, but but it would be an interesting hypothesis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I feel more comfortable about that. Thank you very much for your question. Yeah, it's interesting to think about it. It's not so straightforward, the interpretation. So first we have the problem we should solve. How can we obtain the conditional distribution from one based on the joint distribution of all? And then once we have this solution, we should have some interpretation for that that makes sense for our case. And um, yeah, that's. I wonder if a I wonder if a decision tree approach would work, because uh, you have to decide whether a particular uh, observation falls in the and or the or category, right? Uh, 
actually we don't do this individually. We do this for the whole, I, I think it was not clear from the beginning, but we do this and our uh, weights are done for the whole field, not just yeah, yeah. for each point because we don't have data for that. And that's my point is you could only, you could only do a decision tree approach if you consider the, all of the data points. Um, just to let and you guys that, know, Louis also has had his oh, hands sorry. up for a long Jump in, time. Louis. Yeah, 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 don't, don't, it's okay. about the same <laughs> anyway, but I have another interpretation because okay. I'm taking a course of data simulation and this problem is exactly the topic of data simulation. So if you go to the other slide, the next one, please. Further, okay. Oh, no. No. That, that's this, it. Yes, this. In some way, when you have a at the case C, that is just an, is because we are assuming that the, the data is independent. So we mm -hmm. agree about that. But the, the other case, the case D, in some way, what it's doing is doing the distribution wider. So this happens when, in some way, when you have some correlation between the data. Because if you go to the opposite case, because if you have a correlation that is, they are uncorrelated, you have C, but if it's completely correlated, so the data could should be or one or the other one. So and this I transition think, between- hmm? I don't think that's correct, Luis. No? When, whenever you have correlation, you will always reduce uncertainty by a small amount or a large amount, right? Um, Relative to the initial. The moment yeah. you have correlation, you're saying I have a little bit of information, so I have to a little bit of valid information. Yeah, but, but what's happening if they share exactly the same information? They have a correlation of equal one. And then, but, then you but you have to then you dramatically reduce your information. I, I'm no, sorry. That, that's uh, mean that both in some way are wrong, and you need to choose between one another. And this could be the case. Or sorry, say that again. That when you are in some way, if they are sharing some information, you you have to do it wider in the case that because you are not completely sure that is the, the distribution is the blue or the red one. Yes. So they are sharing some information. So in some way, the, the, the final distribution is kind of wider. Because yes. if you are completely independent, so you'll know that it's middle and it's very, very narrow. OK, but, let's, let, let, just, but let's, let's make sure we get our terminology correct. Independent, uh, consistent, and independent, inconsistent pieces of information are two different things. Yes. When you do and, you're doing independent, consistent pieces of information. When you're doing or, you're doing independent, inconsistent pieces of information. So the combination has to do with the degree of consistency or inconsistency. Yeah, this is my point that this yeah. and or, or probably this, the, the value or the, the factor that she's using, in some way, is kind of measurement of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, let's go back to your data simulation example. You've got a model prediction with uncertainty and you've got an observation with uncertainty. In standard data simulation, Kalman filtering, you assume that both are valid, consistent predictors of the truth. If they are in valid, inconsistent predictors of the truth, either the observation is correct or the model is correct, but you usually assume the observation is correct, right? And in that case, you have to dramatically increase your model uncertainty because you're basically way too confident. Yeah. So you know uh, that 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 that's a situation where you might want to share. You might want to combine the two cases by using a weighted combination because you're saying that there's a degree of inconsistency between my model and reality, and I'm trying to estimate that degree of inconsistency. And that would yeah, be, this for this is this reason I said this is kind of another interpretation about the same that is kind exactly. of the, what's happening there. Makes sense, yeah. but that's a that, but that's a consistency of the interpretation, not a property of the medium, right? So that, that's why that's why I'm a little un, that's I'm not saying that Stephanie's wrong. I'm saying I'm just uncomfortable about the interpretation. I think it needs more thinking, at least to convince me. I had a question about like a, a hypothetical case for those. PDFs that maybe has to do with that inconsistency issue. So, so what if you had conditional PDFs that didn't overlap? Like, you know, you, you couldn't do the, 
the the and has no overlap, I guess. Um, would that mean that you're forced into doing like an or? Yeah, now you don't know which one is true. Yeah, so, so, so it's like conditional on the knowledge of these three pieces of information. You'd make three different, completely different decisions and there's no, there's no overlap. Does that happen? Right. So, so let's say, let's say that uh, somebody comes into my office and uh, they're wet, their clothing is wet, right? And I ask uh, two different people, uh, uh, one person, uh, why, why the clothing is wet? And one person says, it's raining outside. The other person says, uh, um, uh, uh, I know some other reason for the person being wet, right? And um, so, so we've got all the possibilities. You know, one is true. Uh, the first, the first explanation is true. The second explanation is true. Presumably, both are true, and the fourth is neither are true. <laughs> and we have to consider all of those, right? So, when I get inconsistent pieces of information, unavoidably, my uncertainty has to go up because I don't know which one to believe. And unfortunately, Bayes' law basically only assumes that uh, the information that you're putting into Bayes' law equations is, is uh, both are true, right? So maybe the way we treated this case, for example, let's say we have two distributions that don't want to overlap. Yep. What we did with field beans, the, the empty beans here with the method. And then with this, when when they intersect each other, they will be kind of a, a uniform distribution here because the, where they overlap, it's, it's very broad. Are you talking about the OR case now? I'm talking about the N because it's where you have the intersection, right? If no, no, you and, and and is when you multiply probabilities together. Yes, is so it, yes. When you multiply, you have the intersection here. So you right? get a peak. You get a very peaky distribution which has lower variance than either of the uh, two, and it no. is going to be in the middle. If you yes, but if they don't overlap at all, like this case here, we can fill beans because here we were working with this. Uh, uh, this uh, PMFs here, they, they are not continuous. Regardless, re regardless, if they don't overlap, when you when you combine two distributions by and, you get a reduction in variance. If both distributions have different means and the same variance, the mean is going to be in between, halfway in between the two, and the variance will be uh, small. Yeah, maybe it's if this distribution is continuous, if you have this infinite tail, but if you don't have it, if your data it stops here, your data stops here, and we fill beans here, the beans will assume the same amount of probability. And then when you multiply two things that they have the same amount of probability, they will converge to a uniform distribution. Probably so not you, exactly the if same. If you've got but... if you've got two dis if you've got two discontinuous distributions, they cannot be consistent. The product is going to give you zero everywhere. If they if they have empty beans, yes. If, if, but if, but if, then if the, two, if the two distributions don't overlap, right? Then the, mm -hmm. the product of the two is going to give you zero everywhere. But the moment yes. they don't overlap, you know that they're inconsistent. Yes, we know that they they should have the highest uncertainty possible, right? Because because they're inconsistent. Exactly. And then the way we did this was to filling beans that are empty, and this would converge to the uniform distribution. And then was how we add this uh, new or this uncertainty we have from our data to the end combination, for example. Yeah, so you're using or because they're not consistent.
you, you, you don't get to have it both ways, I'm sorry. <laughs> Right, so so the end result is that you can be forced into a situation where you have to use an or in order to get a PDF to yes. make a prediction. Absolutely. Because even if you use the and or, would that case also end up being zero because you're multiplying by a zero? So it would still give you... No, because and or means you're doing a combination of and and you're doing a combination of or, and then you're weighting the two and, sum and summing them together. Yes, and then let's say that the n goes to zero here, and then you have a one part here in this equation, and then your or would get all the weight in this case. Right. Yeah. So I think adding the term consistency, inconsistency here made a lot of things uh, uh, a lot clearer and um, you know, it's completely obvious if you analyze fields like Stephanie did that mixing what you learned in the upper left corner and the lower right can lead to inconsistent cases. Um, but of course, you still keep some consistency from the things you learned in the upper left. And that's where this, this weird combination comes from. And you can then ask the question, would it be better to learn locally valid or local um, rules only and not mm. blurring things by, you know, um, uh, integrating over a larger region. And that's uh, a good question you can ask if we should learn where, where's the optimal trade off between locality and generality of what we learn. Mm -hmm. I do think your um, your example of a binary heterogeneous medium is an interesting worth, one worth thinking about more because people talk about heterogeneity, but then when they talk about sampling, they talk about sampling at a larger scale than the heterogeneity, right? But now if your sample is at a smaller scale than the local heterogeneity, then you could potentially have this binary medium uh, kind of situation where um, the value in one medium is completely uninformative about the value. I mean, that's unlikely in reality, but is, is only partially informative about the value in the other, re in the other, in the other medium. Yeah. I mean, Hoshin, if you have this collection of, of um, internally homogeneous bubbles that are heterogeneous, then it should show in the infogram that for exactly the separation distance of your bubble size, um, your, your distribution is uh, Dirac. And after that, uh, it becomes uh, a uniform distribution across all colors that you have in your field. No, 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 no. Because... So, so yes. let's, say, let's say you've got a bin with white balls and black balls, right? Randomly, randomly distributed in the bin. And you, put your, and you put your measurement point at the center of a white ball. Um, so as long as you're sampling within the radius of the ball, you're gonna have very strong correlation. And then as you go out, your correlation is going to drop. But as you keep, uh, widening your circle, right? The correlation becomes more of an average of the number of balls that you have in that circle. And then as you go out to the, to the extreme, you know, it's the average of the large, the large thing. That's what I meant by when you've got a heterogeneous medium and is your, is your sampling measurement at a smaller scale than some large radius, which includes both, or is it a small at a smaller scale than some radius, which includes both? If it's at a smaller scale than the radius, then that power would reflect the probability of sampling a white or a black ball. I think, anyway. <laughs> Yeah. 
but I'm not a geologist, so I can't, I can't say anything about whether that's a reasonable description of reality. So. But uh, at least it makes sense with my idea of, with the correlation that in some way it's related with that too. Because in the moment that they are not correlated, we really we cannot transfer information from one to another. So they are kind of treasure. Very thought provoking. I'm sorry, I missed the front part of your talk. You were talking about time series there, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, this was the most, there, there was a lot of inputs in this method here, but the, the other one was more about um, exploring PMFs and extracting the amount of information, how, how can we reduce the uncertainty of them? So it was basically that. Can I come back and ask a question about the first one? Sure. Really quick. Um, so I guess I didn't I didn't quite catch um, like the, the purpose of classification. So is there uh, is there a benefit to or, or like are you aiming for a certain sensitivity or like is there a greater cost to a false negative or you know false, like uh, is it agnostic of that or can you tune it somehow to um, to target say um, uh, performing better at true positives um, at the cost of maybe, you know, false negatives or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, like, so you're, you're classifying whether something is a precipitation event based on monitoring stream flow. Um, and so I, I'm like the, I guess the performance, the classification performance, um, is there a way to um, reduce the number of safe uh, some other performance metric, like, you know, the, the number you miss or getting all the, you know, not missing any true positives or mm -hmm. does that make any sense? Yeah. So the, there is no optimization here in this method as we have in her, but let's say uh, normally the number of events in a catchment if you count the time steps you have would be very low in relation to the time steps that with no events. So you have more no events than events in a time series from normally. And then if you have, you could have a dump model that just predicts non-events. And in this case here, your hits would be 88%, right? because 88% of your time steps are saying, okay, we are no event. And then since we don't have optimization for that, we are... Uh, I guess, Stephanie, so, Stephanie, mm, yes, I, I think yes. the question was about what's the use of instead of using the time series, um, separating it into events and no events. So is that a useful signature? It, was that the question, Dan? Yeah, what's, it, what's the decision about? Like, was it applied to? Yeah, and so one, one possible use for that is, for example, if you want to compare long time series of model simulations and observations, you want to see if peak discharge of an observed event and the corresponding peak discharge of the simulation are you know, close in time and close in value. And for this, you often need to separate, you need to isolate relevant individual events rather than comparing each individual point in time. You know, if you also want to identify timing error. So that was the, the reasoning behind isolating and uh, uh, identifying events in such time series. Another application, if you want to, now I got your question, <laughs> thank you. Uh, another application, if you want to characterize your events, like you could correlate them with, uh, relate them with the precipitation you have, and then you can check the time needed from the rain to get you on your 
stream gauge, or you could get the, as Uwe said, the, the peak of your events or the duration of your events, you could, you could characterize better your catchment with this information. Thanks. Is there any other question? <coughs> or comment? Sorry, Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I start, sorry, how, how are you defining an event? Uh, sorry if I missed that. <laughs> so here, the events were first classified by by us, so it was okay. what we define as event, but it's basically, in our case, this periods of rise and peak and recession in a river discharge, so. Um, but so, for example, you've got this one at June 7th uh, on the left, and then just before mm -hmm. that, you've got a little peak. Why was that not considered an event? I'm just trying to understand the definition. Um, yeah, so in our catchment here, we had a bit of snow melt that were like these events here. It was more a manual classification. And probably in this, it, it was not made by me, but probably in this case here, it was too small to be considered by the expert and event. So, so size was a criteria. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The volume, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you. So Thank you. What's, what's next on the agenda? Okay, so we have uh, our next meeting is going to be on March 9, and we are still deciding what are we going to discuss. A crunch field paper is very thought provocative, and I don't know if somebody wants to volunteer to do that paper in the next session, or if anyone else wants to present their work. So... Ubi and I are reading the Crutchfield paper. I don't know if it'll be ready in three weeks, but uh, we'll let you know. Um, there we go. Awesome. Um, okay. There's also a follow-up paper by another guy. Um, well, there's lots of work that I'm, I'm discovering. But, um, Agree. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's extremely long. It's not something you could cover in one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I have been just reading pieces of it, and yeah, each of the pieces is. It takes time to digest it, <laughs> so absolutely. Okay, I'm going to send you a link to this other paper, which I think has a nice overview. But, uh, but in the okay. meantime, we should try to identify uh, uh, something else because that might take a little while to prepare. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. So yeah, I will send an email with the papers that we have in the list and asking if anyone else wants to. To, to present in the meantime. Okay. Oh, yeah. it's, it's really nice, uh, Stephanie, to see how information theory is starting to, your, 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 your presentation was a nice example of how it's being applied more broadly uh, in the earth sciences. And I was, Praveen's not here, but I was going to say sometime in the next one, two or three years, we might want to consider doing another special issue. Um, to follow up on, you know, papers related to information theory and the geosciences uh, might be something to sh shoot for and try to uh, get other people from outside of the small group to contribute and maybe even join the groups. So. Awesome. With that, I think we can close this session. So thank you, Stephanie, for the great talk and. Thank you everyone for the great discussion. I think we learned a lot today. <laughs> and so, yeah, let's see each other in three weeks. Okay. Right. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye.